Well, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the Hugh Lane's uh, Drawing Day project. And today, um, my name is Beth O'Halloran, and we are going to be talking about some ideas um, that we've borrowed from history, um, from a guy called Baudelaire, a writer, um, Charles Baudelaire. And he wrote about this idea of something called a flannerer. Um, and I thought, well, just, I'll just kind of outline a, a couple of the things we're going to cover. And then um, through the slideshow, I'm going to walk you through um, ways that you might be able to take your everyday life, maybe something like a very short walk. We're all getting used to doing our walks now with COVID and how you could use your walk as a reference to do a series of drawings. And I thought because we're talking about something that's like a continuum, we might use something like a concertina book as the format for your drawings so that the drawings kind of unfold the way a journey does. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you here what we're going to cover and then we'll, I'm, I'm breaking it down into sections. So it'll take about just over half an hour. So as I said, the drawing event is, we're gonna discuss what is a flanwer and how might that idea inspire your drawing practice. And this idea, as I mentioned, drawing from everyday life. And we're going to talk about incorporating the drawings into one long drawing. Okay. And then, um, it's not going on to the next slide. Oh, there we go. So sorry, we can cut that. Um, okay, so part of the idea for this workshop was inspired by this quote. Um, sorry, my dog's gonna join us. <laughs> This quote by Peter Lenschak, and it says, all of us are watchers of television, of time clocks, of, the, of the traffic on the freeway, but few of us are observers. Everyone is looking, but no one is seeing. Now that's maybe not entirely true, but I just thought that was an interesting thing because we're all so stuck in our screens. And often I find that when I'm going for my walk, I'm still looking at my screen. So I thought part of the idea for this workshop was maybe to get us to lift our noses from our screen for a little minute and just look around at our walk while we're on our walk and see if that might be a little bit more of a relaxing event and some inspiration for our drawings. So here it is. This workshop is inspired by the idea of flannerism. And that's a term for strolling used by, as we said, Charles Baudelaire to identify an observer of modern urban life. And this bit I thought was really funny, that some flaneurs were famously uh, seen walking with a tortoise on a string to slow themselves down so they might pay better attention to what was around them. Okay, so that might give you a little idea of the kind of, of people we're talking about. That they might have had a little bit of leisure time. But this I just thought was a nice image to show you. This is really what, what we've been living it with for such a long time now. I know it's changing as of this week, but all these quiet streets where maybe we got to see the architecture and even the trees of the city in a little bit of a clearer way because it's been so quiet. So just, just to clarify again, some of the ideas that Baudelaire talked about were usually the flanner was male, surprise, surprise, it was in the 19th century, 1900s, um, 1800s, sorry, um, no visible means of income. So that means you couldn't tell what he did for a living. Um, he was very contemporary and stylish. I mean, really, that, that word that we'd use now for, for a flannel would be something like a dandy. And that might make more sense to us. Um, he was aloof and unreadable and a strolling observer with no specific purpose except to pay attention. Sorry. Um, I, thought, I thought our own uh, James Joyce sounded a little bit like that. And you kind of think about the idea of, of Ulysses is just basically a long walk through the city on one day. We have a similar idea, if anybody's read Virginia Woolf, Mrs. Dalloway, I'm just reading this now for the first time. I thought it was in interesting how similar herself and James Joyce were. So this has been a common theme throughout literature and in the visual arts, which is obviously where our connection is today. This I just thought was a nice one. It's a self-portrait by, by Baudelaire. So you can see it's a multi-talented chap um, very sensitive face, and that would be really typical now of the of the flannel or the dandy with a big cravat at his neck. Um, so here are some of his suggestions for ways that we might approach the city. He thought that it might be interesting to read the city as a text, which I thought was a nice idea. 
So to really think about maybe whatever street names you pass on your walk, could those be a little bit of an inspiration for a creative exploration, you know, as maybe titles for your drawings? What, what kind of tree species do you pass? And we're gonna talk about an artist who specifically focuses on that exact thing. Would the color of the brickwork be a way that you could plan a color drawing? You know, the way where I live, there's lots of different colors brick, of bricks going from red to orange and yellow ochre, brown. <clears throat> or what about all those plaques that you see on people's houses? Like that could be a little, a little series that you could do a link of, or even familiar statues could be looked at from new angles. Um, Baudelaire wrote a lovely uh, text on how he thought marble statues were so real looking, he imagined that they could feel. And if they could, you know, what emotions do you think they might have and what might they make you feel? And maybe you could think about, well, who, who might have been there looking at those statues long before you were? It's just a couple of ideas to get the juices flowing. And um, this is a piece from our collection here in the Hugh Lane. And it's by Edouard, Man Edouard Manet, who happened to be Baudelaire's best friend. So there's a nice little link. So here we have this image of um, people sitting down for a concert. Apparently this happened twice a week in Paris, very nice. And they were in Les Jardins des Tuileries, the Tuileries Gardens, and they're all just sitting down listening to the music. But there's a good few um, famous faces in here. And this guy right over squeezed into the left is Manet himself. And I thought you could sort of tell a little something about Manet's character, the way he's literally painted himself right out of the painting. So you can only see half of his head. You see, that's just his face peeping in. And that's quite a modest thing to do, isn't it? You're gonna think he's really showing himself as the observer of the scene. He's not, it's not all about him. He's there watching all of these people enjoying the concert. But then over here, I thought this was also really sweet. This is his brother who's put almost right in the middle of the painting. So you can see how fond he is of his, or was of his brother. But then over here where you hardly even notice him is uh, Baudelaire. And one of the things that the historians say, the reason that Baudelaire is painted so sort of sketchily and that there are people farther away in the distance that are clearer is that the sketchy sort of loose brushwork summed up the way Baudelaire and Manet were thinking about modernism and this sort of loosening up of ideas around well, what is art and a lot of other famous people in that painting too so that, that's well worth a visit when, when you can get back into the gallery. So this is another gem we have in the collection that I thought fitted with the theme where you can see these chaps in the background I'd say a lot of you have seen this painting before it's not in the gallery at the moment it's over having its it's a little spell in London. You know, we do that swap with the paintings. So, but many of you will be familiar with this. It's usually in the first room um, of the gallery um, downstairs. Um, and it's called the Les Parapluies, the French for umbrellas. And it's an interesting different take on that sort of um, that leisure society we just talked about there with the flaneurs who got had enough time on their hands that they could take these very slow walks with their tortoises. Whereas the other half of society would be like this, this woman in the center of Renoir's painting. So you can see that she's wearing very plain clothes as opposed to see the woman and children beside her. They're dressed in all these fancy velvets and lace. There's even a, 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 a peacock feather in the little girl's hair and an ostrich feather around her hat. She's, she's holding an ivory um, hoop. Uh, so this, these are very well-to-do ladies here. Whereas the woman on the left is in a much plainer outfit. And that's how we know that she was the maid of the house. But we can see the dandies in the background. Can you see the, the, all those chaps with their fancy hats on and their suits? And do we notice that they all have umbrellas? So the only person who doesn't have shelter from the rain is this woman in the middle. And I thought that that was a nice sort of correlation with the way we've been talking about COVID and how some people have had protection and, and a lot of people like our poor friends in India haven't. So you can see here at the very center of the painting, what do we notice but her empty basket. So you can see she, she is the only one who's being really left out. Okay, so let's see if I go on to the next one. Okay, another thing I was thinking about in that theme of COVID and something that 
while I was doing the reading for this, this idea came up of this guy called Matthew Beaumont. And he talks about a, a kind of a state of mind that we can have when we're recovering from illness or worrying about illness. I think it could be another thing that's been a theme for all of us. But Beaumont says that um, uh, convalescence is the state between health and illness. And it's the perfect mode for discovery as it makes us raw and sensitive. And this is in part of his book called The Walker on finding and losing yourself in the modern city. So he had this thing and I kind of, you know, you know that sense, even when you just had a bad cold and you've been stuck inside for a few days and then you head back out and you know the way everything just seems brighter and noisier. So I thought it, just in case any of you are just coming back into the world, I hope you're feeling better, but that, that it might be a nice time to, to, yeah, to do something that helps you reflect on, on what you're seeing in a different way. And just a little touch on here um, that I've been talking a lot about uh, male writers and, and artists, but there's, there's this great book by a woman called Re Rebecca Solnit. She also did a lot of photographs in this book and she, she um, documents her walks all through different cities, mostly San Francisco. And another amazing woman who I didn't include in my slide is Cheryl Strayed. She's written this book called Wild. And if any of you are looking for a good holiday read, this is it. And it's about her walking a thousand miles of the west coast of America and all of the adventures she has. But can really this idea of being walking as an observer and also as a way to make art. Same with this, this one is really good too, if you're looking for any reading. The flanus, so it's the female perspective. Anyway, now to some other artists who are doing these interesting things around their walks. Um, this is Ethna Jordan, and again, maybe some of you have seen Ethna's wonderful exhibition in the Hugh Lane Gallery. This was just recently, um, I think just two years ago. Um, and Ethna did this project where she went around the city at times when she thought it was going to be its quietest. So as you can see here, this big storm we had in 2011, say some of you remember that. And she just went out and took photographs and then did a lot of paintings from those photographs. So, she did them over a series of years, so not just the storm, but times when she thought the city was quiet. Just, just noticing there is an actual hum of quietness off these paintings, isn't it? And you'll, you'll notice um, there's never any human presence in these paintings. Um, and you'll see that the source of light is often just that bare bulb or the light inside a house where she's on the outside very like Edward Hopper, who we'll have a little look at as well. I really like that one because her inclusion of that much of the road in front of the buildings does not make it seem even emptier and more, more quiet. You kind of think, was that first thing in the morning or very just before, before dusk? I think it was first thing in the morning because there's no traffic at all. And this was this woman I was telling you about that there's somebody else who uses trees. Sorry, um, Katie Holton is an Irish artist, but she's been based in New York City for quite a long time. And I think she might have been missing the green of Ireland. Um, she got this lovely idea to start really focusing on the tiny little pockets of nature she could spot in the city. So she went all around New York and she took photographs of the spindly little trees that were growing at the side of the road. And then you'll see here, but sorry, the slide's not that detail but under each of these little drawings she has here is the name of each tree so this one is an ash i think this is a beech or maybe it's a birch a cedar so so you'll notice that they go up in the letters of the alphabet so she's done the whole alphabet as a series of trees and then after she did this she made this beautiful book out of them where she basically wrote poems using the trees as the words, so she used like the like B for the birch of it. So she wrote all of these things. So it looked, every page looks like a forest, but then she actually wrote out some passages from James Joyce's Ulysses. So I thought that was a nice little connection as well, her, little, her walks through the city. So this is another interesting person looking at trees, Tim Knowles. Um, he's a UK artist and he uses trees actually as the thing that do the drawing. So you can see maybe here in the detail, have a closer up shot of this. He's tied these uh, ink 
uh, pens to the actual branches of the tree and then he lets the tree do the drawing so you'll see the next one see that it's just this big squiggle but that's that's a lovely pine tree drawing <laughs> so just maybe you have like one of my students one time did this with a weeping willow in her back garden and the drawings were beautiful so that might be something fun to try Another thing I thought, just to kind of get a different perspective on your walk and then using it as material for your drawings, night walks. You know the way everything does look different at night, obviously. And there's a fancy name for this called noctambulism. Um, and it's, um, a, according to Baudelaire, a magical pursuit. And he said that the mystery of shadows recast familiar places as strange or special. And that it's the combination of artificial light the absence of other people, prowling foxes and shadows, and that they all add up to help us to see the everyday anew, and that that is the ultimate goal of the Flannery. Okay, so a nice idea, do a whole series of drawings of shadows. I just thought that was a nice image. <laughs> so I don't know who took that one. Um, the member I mentioned, um, Ethna Jordan had was very much influenced by Edward Hopper. So this is, so Edward Hopper came well before Ethel Jordan. You can see that was painted in 1928. I think it'd be nice to just take note of that date. And for, for those of us who can remember our history, um, that coincides with the American depression. Okay, so some of those ideas, I think we're tying into things that we're thinking about now with all the economic doom and gloom. And people are looking at things in, a, a, uh, in that way of being outside and inside. And Edward Hopper was, always taking these long walks at night and trying to look into people's lives and often then telling these stories through his paintings of people who may have seemed very isolated. There's, a, there's this um, historian, and I don't know if this is completely true, but he writes about Edward Hopper's painting that, that he's never painted a painting where there's two faces actually looking at each other. I have to say, I've never found that in any of them. So they all, if, if you see more than one person in his paintings, they're still not connecting to each other. Even that most famous Nighthawks at the diner, which I, didn't, I don't have, because I thought you'd probably all know that one. But this one, I, I was including this because I thought, again, if you were interested in doing a series of shadow drawings, those dramatic lights and darks of hoppers could be great inspiration. It's nice, another one. Again, you can see the link with Ethna Jordan really giving Hopper a nod, I think, there. And that one I thought, nice little pop of colour. You know, it's a night painting, but with the lit up window, you can really see, see some drama in that. And again, just noticing where he's placing the shadows. See how, how the expanse is leading us in. We've got this big tri triangular, it's almost like a path into the painting. So it's like we are, we're kind of connecting to the shadow. There is a little self-portrait for you. That's me walking my doggos, but <laughs> I just thought, but um, this, just to show you some ways that you might end up just seeing a little bit of a different perspective when you're going out for your, your night walk. And I looked, I just was looking up. So there's a few that I took just to give you some, some fun ideas. That's again me just in Herbert Park. And I like this one, you know, I was just looking at, at a tree, you know, the way when you look at the source of light behind the branches of a tree, they often look at, like they're curved. So I thought that could be a nice way to do some nice line drawings. Um, a, a little touch of colour. Again, I thought the shadows were really nice in that one. It was just the traffic light changing in the background. And that one, my dogs gave me a big jiggle on the lead. But I thought that turned out into a really nice sort of feathery, almost impressionist photograph, quite by accident. Okay, so then a couple more ideas for you guys. So Flanner activities. Okay, so we talked about it being a slow walk. Again, I imagine that when, again, when I'm walking my dog, he stops maybe every four feet. Sometimes it really frustrates me, but that idea of doing something that slows you down. Sometimes if you're walking an elderly relation, that might get you to just really change your pace. Or if you're holding the hands of a toddler, <laughs> slows it all down. So it's a, it, um, Baudelaire says, ambling is best enjoyed slowly and daydreaming, a dandy does nothing. Um, so, and sorry, I can't completely see the text, but something about walking a tortoise. So for this workshop, find new ways of recording line and documenting and recording movement. 
gathering visual marks and expanding your ways of drawing. Okay, so this is a chance to record, gather and collect details that you might see on your daily walk and make drawings from those marks in possibly a new way. So here are some tips on spotting some marks and a way to plan your gatherings. Okay, so I'm going to show you, basically, I took a whole load of photographs on my, my dog walk yesterday. So really, I went nowhere. And I just took loads and loads and loads of photographs of all the things I saw. And then I've just tried putting them under different headings to show you one way that you might start to plan a series of drawings on a very loose theme. Okay, so I just, so um, I, and I thought I could give you a few pointers on how to start thinking about this yourself. Okay, so these are things I was thinking about heading out. You could collect uh, images of five related lines, as in drawings of photographs, marks, or textures to make drawings from. So things like, and maybe when you're thinking of line, really break that apart for yourself. So all the different kinds of lines that there are. A soft line, okay, that's gonna be really nice in charcoal or pastel. A line that bends, <clears throat> how can you do that? A line that changes, can you record? I was thinking like looking at the railroad, tra railroad tracks. An imaginary line, you know, maybe behind a plane in the sky. A line that disperses, a line that dissolves, a line that loosens, a line that disappears, or the places where weeds grow. A snail's journey. So record five journeys in five ways. And some questions you might ask yourself are, how can you record a route that you've already taken? And how can you make record your journey in different ways? So notice what elements help you to orientate yourself. Is it the architecture? Familiar trees? Okay, so here's some of my pieces that I'm hoping will inspire you. I've put this series as nature as glimpses. So little, little scraps of nature. Some little get me nots that my dog has christened several times. Little, I don't know the names of these, but I think they look like little tiny violets growing up a wall. See? Nice little weed of some kind. And this one just, just places where nature's kind of reclaiming this, the, bits of pavement and places behind things. And here's another little prompt for you. Okay, so say you don't know how to get started. Go out your front door and do four quick drawings from four directions, turning your body 90 degrees each time. So obviously we're gonna get a drawing of your front door because <laughs> you just come out. So then what happens in the three other directions? And now take your walk and begin to notice any marks that start to form a pattern. Okay, you'll see metalwork on your path, manholes, water pipe covers, or marks left in cement, footprints, leaf imprints, animal tracks, or perhaps you'll notice color, graffiti, signage, a color that repeats. So I'm just gonna show you a bunch of those. <laughs> okay, so here again, it's just little pockets of, of hidden nature and things that we just often think of just as weeds or things that need to be cleared away. And then text in the city. Look for graffiti, signs, or road markings as a theme. So I just, I just then tried to isolate the bits of graffiti so I couldn't really read the words, but just wanted to see them more as marks. So just little scraps of them. You know the way you start to see letters just as nice shapes when you isolate them like that. And those little dots in the background there are like, they're like the tiny little feet that um, Ivy uses to cling on to poles. <laughs> so farther down in the pole, you could see all of the Ivy that had been cut, but I just thought they looked like they'd left a little a little drawing behind them there. I thought that one was funny because it looked like it said art, even though it said Arthur. <laughs> so, um, okay, take a little drink. Again, just isolating a little patch of graffiti, you could get some very nice drawings. So say you did 
four panels of something like that. That'd be a very nice way to, to build up a series. Just introducing a bit of texture. Um, so I think, yeah, the thing linking all of these was just that there was some text mixed with metalwork or a te um, natural te textures. So speaking of textures, maybe look for stains, blobs, chewing gum, cement drops, peeling paint, curling wood, you know, it's all good, good material. <clears throat> There's a nice bit of rust. Peeling paint, again, I thought that, that it's really nice when you can see it, the under layers of things like that. Maybe even getting the texture of the grain of the wood in, that could be a nice rubbing. I thought that was like, just where they patched the cement. But to me, it looked like, like a cloud just blurring across the wall there. Same again, just a little seam in the cement. Bit of chewing gum. Some accidental drips. And then back into some textures, just, you know, peeling wood. You can see the same graffiti. <laughs> this I thought was fun, because do you notice there is a little snail underneath? And actually, if it was a clearer photograph, it was quite a dark day. There's actually about 20 little snails hiding under there, all kind of waiting for, this, for the, the rain to come back, I think. So that was the next theme, hidden nature. So maybe find a snail and its trail might look like a drawing, or maybe you can find paw prints in cement. So there's, there's just a little leaf there I thought was nice, just like a little bit of hidden nature. There's the snail up close. There he is again, going on his journey. And this, not a great photograph of that, but I was trying to show you the snail trail. That's just a different way to see a drawing. Jackie Irvin, um, the Irish artist, she did a whole film about snail trail drawings. So that might be a fun one to Google. This, again, I'm not sure if you can make it out, but that's just a little feathery cobweb. Um, so I thought that could be a nice little theme as well. It's an artist called Via Kelmans, a Norwegian artist. She's done a huge number of drawings about cobwebs. So believe it or not, that's not a photograph. That is a drawing. It's extraordinary. And the way she got the white was by rubbing out. So she covered the whole thing in pencil and then she's managed some, with some very fine tool to rub away the drawing to make the white. She's done it again. So I think they look like these really ghostly old photographs. So another thing you might think about drips, scratches, worn places, rust, weeds, we've covered those. But to me, this looks like this, a wise old man's smiling face. <laughs> Um, another nice little drip. Oh, I think I was getting some good mileage out of those snails under there. Um, nice, just a combination, just like there's a single brick in the middle of a stone wall. So see if you can see things like that that don't quite fit together. We're, whenever we're doing a drawing, any kind of contrast is a nice way to, to kind of get started. Some nice texture. You could do a series like that where you just focus in on, you know, door metal versus wood. So handles, the door locks, um, the numbers on doors. This is, I thought, another way to see lines. You know, you could do a series of cracks. I remember with my little ones, one time we, we did a series of drawings of all their favorite puddles. And then we did a big puddle map. <laughs> um, so it could be just something like that. Those remind, that reminded me of their puddle maps. All these just these little accidental marks and scratches i think these are man-made marks but there's something so natural about them these sort of accidental marks where a door has just been scraped across something they really start to look like oriental paintings to me oh yeah and here's an artist i thought would be a fun one to look at as he directly links his paintings his entire body of work actually to graffiti and walls and wall markings. So this guy called Anthony Tapies, he's, he's no longer with us. But he's a Catalan artist who's based in Barcelona. And I don't know if any of you have been to Barcelona, you know, the, the walls of Barcelona are so old and they have all these amazing layers and layers of graffiti, sometimes an entire wall covered in chewing gum. But then another one that just had a graffiti from the 1800s, he was a beautiful swirly writing. 
So Tapies would go and he just takes lots and lots and lots of photographs of different little patches of these walls and then does these paintings from them that I think really look like you can you can see the reference material from the kinds of things we were just looking at. That's one of his. Still not look just like the thing in the back lane. <laughs> just good. Um, and he actually uses a lot of materials that builders use. You know, he puts um, marble dust and granite and uh, cement dust into his paintings to really mimic walls. So close up, so you can really see, I think that looks very like cement there. Then another, another theme that you could link your series to is color. So again, this is just in my back lane, just some doorways. That's great. My new neighbors have this fabulous new pink door. My older neighbors maybe need a little love there. <laughs> and then, yeah, so this is just linking, linking through color. I like that this one, you can see that there's obviously the natural green, but that, that there's, so, there's basically four or five different greens in that. So it could be a nice way to explore lots of different ways to get tones. And here it, to get this, this, this olive green, you'd actually mix yellow and black. So I thought that again, that kind of thing could be a really nice exercise in color and obviously texture. Lines. Okay, so, so seeing your lines in new ways. What about doing a line drawing of railings? Again, my dog's lead, big feature. But the reason I took this was because my other dog is pointing out the paw prints here. I think they were done by a little cat. So I thought that was a nice little drawing. Again, a drawing here left by a van going back and forth across this pole many times. This one does a good series of different lines where you've got the line of the paint, barbed wire, obviously the line of the telephone pole and the metal pole, and then this corrugated lines going the other way that show perspective. See so that idea of things disappearing into sort of a, a wedge shape, the farther away they go, just like they're on a railway track. The lines of ivy, you know, that's lovely squiggly lines you could get there. Again, I thought that looked just like the same shape as the ivy. And then a collection of marks. Okay, so this is going to bring us into our last few slides, but we're going to look at another artist who puts these things together. So here's, again, stuff from my back lane, a blob, a bit of graffiti and a scratch. Um, same, just a bit of a few marks that I thought formed a nice sort of collection of different ways to, to make, make a drawing. This reminded me um, of Joseph Boys, another artist who really uses very accidental marks to, to make his work. But this guy, Cy Twombly, my favorite painter in the world, um, his whole practice is based on this exact exercise. Okay, so he, you can see over here on the left of the painting, that to me looks like that pole where the van had just been had, had scratched across a million times. So Twombly had based his practice, he was from New York originally, he was a New York abstract expressionist, but he in his later career lived in Rome. And he sp spoke about that exact thing Tapia is described, of photographing wall after wall after wall and all these little, little patches and panels where he'd collect images of the graffiti and just images of the history of people interacting with the city and he put them all together in these epic paintings like this is this is like each of these panels is at least a meter and a half wide so this is a huge painting that would basically tell a story often um he'd be telling a classical story of some major roman or um or greek myth this is another one of his but again i think I think you'd be for forgiven for thinking that could be in your own back lane, <laughs> a series of blobs on your walls. But you can see the direct link, all those sort of quite accidental, almost childlike look, looking mark, markings. Okay, so now our actual activity, I thought I could just show you in case this is something that you wanted to do, say you've done your series of drawings, how might you put them all together? Take another little sip. I thought it really makes sense to do something like a concertina notebook. Okay, and just in case that you haven't tried that before, there's basically two different ways you can do it. And I'm gonna show you a couple of illustrations of those. 
You can use multiple types of paper joined together. That can look really interesting. So multiple types of paper. Don't be shy about using any type of paper. Like I, I would use post-its plus a bit of foolscap paper plus a bit of A4 paper plus a bit of cardboard. So it really looks like a collage and then would mimic something like a mishmash walk through a back lane. So all the, the pieces of paper will have all different heights. It could end up looking a bit like um, a skyscape, you know, like all the different heights of the buildings. So that's multiple types of paper joined together or a continuous fold from one large sheet of paper. OK, so if you don't have a large sheet of paper at home, just put together a few uh, sheets of maybe if you have A3 paper, A4 paper, you know, just the stuff from the photocopier, fold that in half and do it so that you can form a Z. I'll just show you a little image of that. So this top one, you take your A, you know, your A4 piece of paper and you just fold it like it's a document in on itself. Okay. And then that, that will stand up and you'll have a little standing drawing. Or obviously down below the Z fold, you just fold one of the panels back. And then you can stick loads of them together. And that's how you can get a very long drawing that can then still squash down to um, a little book. So that that would be the um, an, an outcome you could have. For that card, I just used um, the front and back of a cereal box. Okay, so that's really nice because it's not too stiff. It's really easy to cut with your scissors. Um, and then it just gives it a little bit of, of support. So that's again, just showing you um, the after aftermath. So here's just a couple of, of nice examples. I thought this one was really nice because it combines um, these really natural looking weeds. So this isn't my own image, it's a student's piece, but you can see th this little scraps of weeds like we were talking about in the presentation mixed with evidence that we're in a, 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 a city, I think, or well, the pylons might not be in the city, but you've got this architectural thing on every second page and then the natural world in between. Okay, it's a nice little contrast. And this one, just for anybody who might be working on something for a portfolio, I thought this could be a really nice way to showcase a lot of drawings. Or if you're interested in animation, the idea of a concertina really works because it, it automatically starts to tell a story because it's it's an unfolding, you know, so so you could do big long um, illustration as just one illustration folded or a whole load of different ones like that. And then I just thought that was a nice one to show that the idea of let's say you were to do something like a series of shadows or just your weeds as as one on each page just black ink really simple. And then that one is the idea there is like um, doing a continuous drawing. So and if you if you laid your all your different pieces of paper out first and then do the drawing. So before rather than putting them all together after you've done the drawing, do it as one big continuous drawing and then fold it. I thought that was a really nice format. And that's it. Okay. I've been talking for such a long time, but I haven't snowed you under with too many ideas, but I hope that idea of being your own flannerer in your own neighborhood might give you a little bit of inspiration. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for your time and attention and hope that you have fun making your own drawings. Um, happy drawing day. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs>